Section 10 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 10. The Singer, by Wilhelm Hauff, Part 3. Six, The singer began, My father was Antonio Bianetti, a celebrated violinist, whose name you may have heard as his travels led him through many countries. I can remember him only from my very earliest childhood, when he taught me the scales. My mother was an excellent singer, and accompanied my father on his travels, appearing with him at his concerts. I was four years old when my father died on one of his journeys, and left us in great poverty. My mother was obliged to support us by her singing. A year later she married a musician who had been very flattering in his compliments and attentions, but she soon saw that he had married her only to utilize her voice. He became musical director in a little city in Alsatia, and then our sorrows began. My mother had three more children, and lost her voice completely. This cut off the better part of my stepfather's income, for it was my mother's singing which had been the main attraction at his concerts. He was very cruel to her after this, and even refused me proper food until he hit upon a means of making me useful. He forced me to sing many hours each day, teaching me the most difficult music, and he made of me one of those unfortunate infinite prodigies whom nature has given a beautiful talent to their own misfortune. My mother could not endure the sight of my suffering. She seemed to be fading away, and we found her dead in bed one morning." What shall I tell you of the years that followed, years of martyrdom for me? I was but eleven years old, and had to attend to the housekeeping, to educate the smaller children, and to learn the songs for my concerts. It was indeed a time of torture. During these years a strange gentleman would come to visit us occasionally, bringing with him a bag full of money for my father. Even now I shiver when I think of him. He was a tall, gaunt man of about middle age, the piercing glance of his small gray eyes cannot be forgotten by any one who has seen him. He seemed to be particularly fond of me. He praised my size, my face, my figure, and my singing. In spite of my protests, he would take me on his knee and kiss me with the words, Two or three years more, and you will be ready, little one. And then he and my stepfather would burst into a wild, coarse laugh. On my fifteenth birthday, my stepfather said to me, Listen, Giuseppa, you have nothing. You are nothing, and you need expect nothing from me. I have enough to do to care for my own three. Little Crystal can now take your place as infant prodigy. All you have, your singing, you have me to thank for, and that must help you to get along in the world. But your uncle in Paris has promised to take you into his house. My uncle in Paris? I cried in astonishment, for I had never heard of such a person. Yes, your uncle in Paris. He may be here any day. You can perhaps imagine how delighted I was at this. It is now three years ago, but I can still remember the happiness of those hours as clearly as if it were but yesterday. It was almost too much happiness to think of the chance of escape from my stepfather's house, to think of an uncle kind enough to take pity on me, and also to think of going to Paris, which had always seemed to me the home of brightness and pleasure. Finally, one evening, a carriage stopped at our door. "'That is your uncle,' said my father. "'I ran downstairs, threw open the door. "'What a terrible disappointment awaited me! "'It was the man with the bags of money. "'I was almost unconscious from fright and disappointment, "'but I cannot forget the ghastly joy that shone out of his grey eyes "'when he saw how tall I had grown. "'I can still hear his hoarse voice in my ears. "'Ah, now you are ready, my dear. "'Now I can introduce you to the great world.' He took me by the hand, and threw the bag which he carried on the table. A shower of gold and silver pieces rolled out of it, and my father cried aloud with joy, while the smaller children crawled about picking up the money that had fallen to the floor. It was the price of my body and soul. The following day we set out for Paris. The gaunt man, I could not bring myself to call him uncle, talked to me incessantly of the brilliant part I should play in his salons, I could not feel any pleasure in it. A strange fear had taken the place of all my joy and happiness. 
We reached Paris at last, and our carriage stopped before a large, brilliantly lighted house. Ten or twelve very pretty girls danced down the broad staircase to meet us. They embraced and kissed me, and called me their sister, Giuseppa. I asked the man, Are these all your daughters, sir? Yes, they are all my good children, he answered, laughing, and the girls and the many servants standing about also laughed loudly. The magnificent apartments and the beautiful garments that were given me distracted my troubled mind a little. The following evening I was most beautifully dressed and led into the drawing-room. The twelve girls, also magnificently attired, sat about at card-tables and on sofas. They were carrying on a lively conversation with a number of gentlemen of varying ages. When I appeared, they all stopped talking and looked at me. The owner of the house led me to the piano and told me to sing. When I had finished, they all applauded enthusiastically. Some of them began to talk to me and appeared very much entertained by my awkward French, which was half Italian. They paid me many compliments, and I blush now to think of some of the words they said. My life went on thus for several days very pleasantly. No one troubled me. I could do as I chose. I had everything I wished for, and I might have been quite content had I not felt a strange fear of this house and of these people. I would try to explain it by my own ignorance, saying to myself that this was the great world and that I should learn to grow accustomed to its ways. And now, dear doctor, look at this insignificant little bit of paper. To it I owe my rescue. I found it one morning on my breakfast tray, hidden beneath a roll. I do not know what kind hand laid it there, but may heaven for ever bless the writer of it, who had taken pity on me before it was too late. In the letter were the words, Mademoiselle, this house in which you live has the worst possible reputation. The women who surround you are all unfit companions for any good girl. Should we have been mistaken in believing Giuseppe innocent of this knowledge? Is she willing to purchase a short time of pleasure with many years of repentance? It was terrible news, for it suddenly, almost too suddenly, tore aside the happy veil of childish innocence that had rested over my soul, and it destroyed all my hopes for the future. What was I to do? I was still too young to have learned to make important decisions for myself. The man to whom this house belonged appeared to me like an evil magician who was able to read all my thoughts who might indeed already know that I had learned the truth, and yet I would rather have died than stay a moment longer in that house. I had heard a girl in the house opposite ours speaking Italian now and then. I did not know her, but did I know anyone else in this great city? The sounds of my own language awoke confidence in me. I would flee to her, and on my knees I would implore her to save me. It was but seven o'clock in the morning. Following the habits of my childhood, I was accustomed to rise early, and it was this that saved me. At such an hour everyone in the house, even to the majority of the servants, was still asleep. Only the concierge might possibly see me, but he was not likely to imagine that any one could wish to escape. I dared the attempt. Throwing a plain dark cloak about me, I hurried down the stairs and slipped past the man at the door without his noticing me. Three steps more and I was free. Across the street to the right lived the Italian girl, I sprang across the roadway and knocked at the door. When the servant opened it, I asked for the signora with the dark curls who could speak Italian. The man laughed and said I probably meant Her Excellency, the young Countess Serafina. Yes, yes, I exclaimed. Please lead me to her quickly. He seemed to hesitate at first, for it was still so early, but my entreaties won him over. He led me up to a room in the second story, told me to wait there, and called a serving-maid whom he told to announce me to Her Excellency. I had thought that the pretty Italian girl was some one of my own class in life. I felt almost ashamed to have to tell my story to a young lady of such position, but I had no time for hesitation. The maid returned in a moment to lead me to the bed of her young mistress. It was indeed the beautiful young lady whom I had heard speaking Italian. I fell on my knees before her and implored her protection. But when she had heard my story she was much moved, and promised to save me. She sent for the man who had let me into the house, and commanded him to say nothing to any one about my being there. She told them to give me a little room, the windows of which opened on to the court. She had my food sent to me there, gave me some sewing to occupy my mind, and I lived there for several days, 
full of joy over my rescue, mingled with anxiety for my future. The house to which I had fled was the home of the ambassador of a small German court. Her excellency was his niece, a young Italian countess, who was completing her education in Paris. She was a most kind and amiable creature, whose benevolence to me I shall never forget. She came to see me every day and tried to comfort me. She told me that her uncle had sent his servants on a secret investigation of the house opposite. The occupants of it were in great alarm at my disappearance, but they were anxious that no word of it should be spread abroad. The servants whispered among themselves that one of the young ladies had thrown herself from a window of the second story into the canal. It happened that my room had been on a corner, one window looking out upon the street, the other down upon the canal which flowed past the house. I remember to have opened the window on that side the morning of my escape. It had probably remained open, and in this way my disappearance was apparently explained. Signora Serafina was just about to return to Italy, and she was kind enough to take me with her. She did even more than this. She persuaded her parents to take me into their home in Piacenza. She engaged masters to perfect my talent. I have to thank her for my art, for my freedom, for my life itself, perhaps. It was in Piacenza that I became acquainted with the musical director, Carlo Bologna. In spite of his name, however, he is not an Italian. He seemed to love me, but he did not declare himself to me there. Soon after making his acquaintance, I accepted the engagement at this theatre. People have been kind to me here. The public has seemed to admire me. My manner of life and my reputation have been unspotted by any calumny. In all these months no man has ever visited me except— I can confess our beautiful relations to you without a blush— except Bologna, who soon followed me here. Now you have heard my story. Tell me candidly, do you think that I have done anything to deserve such bitter punishment? How have I sinned that this terrible thing should happen to me? When the singer had finished talking, the physician took her hand and pressed it warmly. I am very happy, he said, to join the little company of those who have been good to you. It is not much that I can do. It is out of my power to help you to the extent that the kind young countess has done. But I will try to do what can be done to clear up the matter here. And I will also endeavor to bring about a reconciliation with your hot-tempered friend. But tell me, what nationality is this Signor Bologna? Now you are asking me too much, she answered evasively. All I know is that he is of German birth, and I have understood that he left his home because of a family quarrel. He has been in England, and in Italy, and has been there less than a year. But why haven't you told him the story you have told me just now? Giuseppa blushed at the question. She looked down as she answered. You are my physician, my fatherly friend. When I speak to you, I feel as a child might feel when confiding in its father— but how could I speak to a young man about such things? I know his jealous temperament, his easily excited nature. I would never dare to tell him of this terrible snare that I have escaped. I honor and admire your feelings, my dear child. Believe me, it does an old man good to find such delicacy of scruple in these days, when it seems to be considered good form to forget all scruple. But you have not told me all. That evening at the ball, that terrible night— it is true. I have still more to tell you. Whenever I thought back over my rescue, I would send up silent thanks to heaven that my good fortune had led me to such kind people. And also did I praise heaven that, in that terrible house from which I had escaped, they believed me to be dead. For I knew that if that dreadful man had any suspicion that I was still alive, he would come to drag me back his victim, or to kill her, for he had doubtless given my father much money for me. Therefore, as long as I was in Piacenza, I would not accept any of the many favorable offers I received to make a public appearance. But one day, when I had been there about a year and a half, Countess Serafina showed me a Paris newspaper in which I read the announcement of the death of the Chevalier de Planto. Chevalier de Planto, interrupted the physician. Was that the name of the man who took you from your stepfather's house? Yes, that is what he was called. This news from Paris made me very happy, and took away the last obstacle to a public appearance, and to the possibility of my no longer being a burden to my benefactors. A few weeks later I came here to be. Two days ago, as you know, I went to the ball, 
and I will confess to you that I was in a very happy mood. I had not told Bologna what costume I was to wear. I wished to tease him, and then surprise him. But suddenly, as I chanced to be standing alone, a voice whispered in my ear, "'Seppa, how is your uncle?' It was like a clap of thunder. I had not heard that name since the day I had escaped from that terrible man. My uncle? I had no uncle, and there was but one who had passed for my uncle in the eyes of the world, the Chevalier de Planto. I could scarcely control myself sufficiently to reply, "'You must be mistaken.' I attempted to hurry away and hide myself in the crowd, but the stranger pushed his arm through mine and held me fast. Seppa, he whispered, I warn you that you had better walk quietly along with me, or else I will tell all these good people of the company you once kept. I was crushed. Everything looked black before my eyes. I seemed to have but one thought, a terrible fear of shame. What could a poor, helpless girl do, when the stranger, whoever he might be, could tell the world such things of me. It would have been only too readily believed, and Carlo, alas, would not have been the last to accept it as true and to condemn me. Helplessly I followed the man at my side. He whispered dreadful things to me. He told me that I had rendered my uncle, my stepfather, most unhappy, that I had ruined my entire family. When I could endure it no longer, I tore myself away and called for my carriage, but as I looked back once more on the staircase, the dreadful stranger was behind me. "'I will drive home with you, Seppa,' he said with a hoarse laugh. "'I have a few words more to say to you.' I must have fainted, for I remember nothing very clearly until the carriage stopped before this house. I entered my room. He followed me and began to talk to me at once. In deadly terror that he would betray me, I told Babette to leave the room. "'What do you want of me, wretch?' I cried in anger. What evil can you say of me? It was without my own consent that I entered that house, and I left it as soon as I saw what I had to expect there. Do not make a scene, Seppa. There are but two ways to save yourself. Either you pay me ten thousand francs at once, in jewels or in gold, or you follow me to Paris. You must do one of these things, or the whole city will know more about you than you would like. I was beside myself with rage and horror. "'Who gives you the right to make such demands of me?' I cried. "'Tell them if you must, but leave my house this instant, or I will call the neighbors.' I made several steps toward the window, but he followed me and caught my arm. "'Who gives me the right?' he repeated. "'Your father, my dear, your father.' A horrible laugh burst from his lips. The light of the candles fell upon a pair of piercing gray eyes, and I knew who it was that I saw before me. I knew that his death had been only a pretense— a lie spread abroad for some evil purpose. Despair gave me strength. I tore myself from his hold, and endeavored to snatch off his mask. "'I know you, Chevalier de Planto,' I cried, "'and you must answer before the court of justice for your treatment of me.' "'Not too fast, my darling,' he said, and as he spoke I felt the steel in my heart. I believed myself dying. The doctor shivered. It was a bright day, and yet he felt the shudder one experiences when speaking of ghosts in the dark. It seemed to him that he could hear the hoarse laugh of this Satan, that he could see the monster's piercing gray eyes behind the curtains of the bed. "'Then you believe,' he said after a few moments, "'that the Chevalier is not dead, and that it is he who attempted to murder you?' "'His voice, his eyes, tell me that it was he.' The handkerchief I gave you yesterday makes it quite certain. It has his initials in the corner. And will you give me authority to act for you? May I tell in court what you have told me now? I have no other choice. You may tell everything. But first, dear doctor, please go to Bologna and tell him what I have told you. He will believe you. He knows Countess Serafina also. And may I not also know, continued the physician, the name of the ambassador in whose house you were hidden. Why not? It was Baron Martino. Baron Martino, excried Long, in pleasant excitement, he who was in the diplomatic service of Prince X. You know him. He was the ambassador of the prince's court in Paris, and later in St. Petersburg. Oh, that is very good, very good, said the physician, rubbing his hands joyfully. I know him, and he is in this very town, having arrived yesterday. He sent for me this morning. He has taken rooms in the Hotel de Portugal. A tear shone in the singer's eyes, 
and she appeared much moved. "'What a happy chance!' she exclaimed. "'I had imagined him many hundred miles away, and now he is here, and he can bear witness to the truth of my story. Oh, hurry to him, and oh, if Carlo could only be with you when he assures you that I have told the truth!' "'He shall be with me. I will drag him there, depend upon me. And now, my dear child, farewell for to-day. You may be quite calm. Fate will be kind to you once more, I know. And be sure that you take the medicine I left for you, two spoonfuls every hour. The doctor left the room, looking back to receive another grateful glance from his patient. She seemed calm and happy. It was as if the narration of her story had lifted a heavy burden from her soul. She looked with confidence to the future, for a more fortunate fate seemed dawning for her. 7. Baron Martineau, for whom Dr. Lang had done an important service some years before, welcomed him gladly and told him all he wished to know about the singer Bianetti. The Baron not only corroborated the truth of her story, but he was enthusiastic in his praise for her character. He promised to talk about her in this way to every one whom he should meet in the city, and to refute the rumors that were in circulation. He kept his promise, and his high position, and his open praise of the Italian singer, caused a complete reversion of opinion in her favor within a few days. But Dr. Long, when he had finished his visit to the ambassador, mounted a few stories higher in the hotel to number 54, the room where the musician lived. He stood before the door for an instant to get his breath, for the steep stairs had fatigued him. Then he listened, for he heard strange sounds behind the door. There seemed to be someone seriously ill within the room. He heard sighs and deep groans, mingled with dreadful French and Italian curses, and now and then a hoarse, despairing laugh. The physician shuddered. He remembered that the musician's excitability of the day before had seemed to him almost like insanity. Could he have gone altogether mad through sorrow? Dr. Long's hand was already raised to knock at the door when he noticed that it was number 53, and he recognized with relief that he had made a mistake. When he stopped before number 54, he heard sounds of a different character. A man's voice, rich and sweet, was singing to the accompaniment of a piano. The doctor entered and found the young man he had seen in the singer's house the day before. Guitars, violins, loose strings, and sheets of music lay scattered about the room. In the midst of it all stood the musician in a loose black dressing gown, a red cap on his head, and a roll of music in his hands. Dr. Long said later that all he could think of was Marius among the ruins of Carthage. The young man seemed to remember him, and his welcome was a gloomy one, but he was polite enough to push a pile of music from a chair, which he then offered to his visitor. He himself walked about the room with long steps, the flying tails of his dressing gown taking the dust neatly off the tables and books. He did not give the visitor time to say a word, but began at once. You come from her. Aren't you ashamed, with your gray hairs, to be the messenger of a woman like that? I will hear nothing more of her. I have buried my happiness. I am mourning for my dead love. You see, I am wearing my black dressing gown. If you have any understanding of the workings of the soul, this should prove to you that the woman is dead for me. Oh, Giuseppa! Honored sir, interrupted the doctor, if you will but hear me. Hear? What do you know about hearing? Let me try your ear, old man. Listen now. This is woman, he continued, throwing open the top of the piano and playing something which seemed to the physician, who had no great knowledge of music, to be very much like other tunes he had heard. Do you hear how soft this is, how melting, how clinging? But do you not notice also in these intervals the unreliable, fickle character of these creatures? But now listen. He raised his voice, and his eyes shone as he threw back the wide sheaves of his mourning garment. Where men are gathered, there is power and truth. Here there is nothing impure. Here are truly noble and beautiful tones. He pounded about on the keys with great energy, but it seemed to the doctor that this also was like most other music he had heard. "'You have a rather peculiar manner of characterizing people,' said the doctor. "'As we are in the business, might I ask you to show me what a court physician would sound like on a piano?' The musician looked at him with scorn. "'How dare you, earthworm, interrupt my brilliant and magnificent harmonies with your squeaky C-sharp!' The physician's answer was interrupted by knocking at the door. 
a crooked little man entered, bowed deeply, and said, The sick gentleman in number 53 begs the honored director not to make so much noise, for he is very weak and probably very near his passing away from this earth. I send my most obedient respects to the gentleman, replied the young man. As far as I am concerned, he may pass away from this earth as soon as he chooses. He keeps me awake all night with his moaning and his groaning, and he makes me shiver with his godless curses and his horrible laugh. Does this Frenchman imagine that he owns the hotel? If I disturb him, so he disturbs me also. But your honor will forgive me, said the little man. He does not last much longer. You won't disturb his last moments. Is the gentleman so ill? asked the physician in sympathy. What is the matter with him? Who is taking care of him? And who is he? I do not know who he is, for I am hired to care for him in the hotel by the day. I think he calls himself Laurier, and comes from France. He was all right day before yesterday, only a little melancholy. He did not go out at all, and did not seem to want to see the sights of the city. But then I found him very ill in bed one morning, and he said that he had had an apoplectic stroke during the night. But he won't let me bring him a physician, and he curses me when I say I will fetch one. He takes care of himself, and bandages himself. I think he has some old wound from the war which has opened again. Just then they heard the hoarse voice of the sick man next door calling amid curses. The little lackey crossed himself and hurried away. The doctor began again at his task of bringing the stubborn lover to reason, and this time with more success. The musician had taken up an opera score, and was gently humming portions of it. The physician took advantage of this quieter mood, and began to tell the story the singer had told him yesterday. His host did not seem to pay any attention to him at first. He read his score as absorbedly as if he were alone in his room. But gradually he began to take notice, and now and then stopped singing. He would raise his eye from the book and glance at his visitor. Finally he dropped the score altogether and gazed at the speaker. His eyes shone, he moved nearer, and snatched at the arm of the doctor. When the latter had finished his narrative, the young musician sprang up and ran excitedly about the room. Yes, he exclaimed, it sounds like the truth. There's a gleam of truth in it. It may possibly be as you say, but by Satan, might it not also all be a lie? Why such a sudden decrescendo, honored artist? Why jump from truth to lies at one leap? And if I bring you a witness for the truth, what then, my maestro? Bologna stood before him, looking down at him. Ah, if you could do this, I would frame you in gold. This thought alone demands a royal reward. Ah, if we could find a witness! But it is all so black around me, a tangled labyrinth, no escape, no guiding star. Most honored friend, interrupted the doctor. That sounds to me very much like some of the lines from Schiller's Robbers, but in spite of it I do know such a witness, such a guiding star. Ah, bring him to me, cried the other. He shall be my friend, my angel, my God. I will worship him. Now you are leaving out something. I seem to remember some words about a burning sword there, but I can convince you of my good will. The ambassador who received poor Giuseppe into his house happens by a lucky chance to be in this hotel occupying the first-floor suite. If you will condescend to put on a coat and a cravat, I will lead you to him. He has promised to give you all the assurance you need. The young man pressed the doctor's hand warmly, but even then he could not resist a certain theatrical pathos. You are my good angel, he said with much expression. I owe you inexpressible thanks. I will slip on my coat and follow you at once to the ambassador's rooms. End of section 10